Hello, everyone. So uh, welcome to this uh, talk. This talk is going to be about the uh, Blender Studio pipeline. So we're basically going to be covering um, from scratch how uh, things are set up at the Blender Studio. I'm going to give you a demo of uh, the workflow. And uh, yeah, so my name is uh, Nick Alberelli. I am a technical director at the Blender Studio. Like I said, I'll be, demo I'll be demoing a simplified version of our uh, production process. And so this talk is really for anyone who wants to deploy their own studio infrastructure uh, modeled after the infrastructure that we use at the Blender Studio. So let's get started. Um, this is a very simple diagram that explains what we're going to be covering today. Pipeline means a lot of things to a lot of different people, but in this talk we're going to be focusing on the uh, editorial to animation and back workflow. So I'm just going to cover some key concepts here. So we have our, um, if we start this diagram on the left and we have our uh, blender that would contain a video editing sequence. So you can imagine you have some sort of storyboard or some sort of previs video that you would assemble inside a video sequence editor. And um, directly from there, we're able to, and these are all things I will show in the talk. Um, directly from there, we're able to upload uh, our shot data to Kitsu. Kitsu is a project management software we use to assign tasks to different artists. It is also open source. You can self-host it and all that really, really fun jazz. It's made by the guys at CG Wire. And when I say shot data, I mean the name of the shot, when it happens in the film, and for how long that, that shot happens. Um, once we have all that data stored into our Kitsu server, we can then use that data or reference it to actually build uh, the production files that you'll use in your production pipeline. So that'll include your animation, lighting, compositing, all, that, all those files that you need, and we have a uh, add-on that will build all those for you. And once all of the beautiful artistic work has been completed, you will be able to uh, send those files to a render manager. We use the awesome render manager Flamenco. And um, once those renders have been completed, you're able to review them and then uh, re-import them back into your editorial file. So it's like you go from an editorial file that has just a storyboard, you send it all the way to animation, Maybe you get some play blasts to review those play blasts during production, and then you load all that stuff back into your editorial file, and you have a completed movie. So that's the, uh, basically what we're going to be covering today. I have a few more slides to do, and then we're going to go into an actual demo. So uh, if you want to follow along at home, this is really more for the YouTube viewers, but we have two really uh, important pages of interest. We have one called a setup guide, and we also have a usage guide. So the setup is something that you, would have to, you wouldn't be able to follow along with that uh, during this talk because there's a lot of setup to do, but I will show this page quickly. But the setup is essentially how to get to the point that I'm at now before we actually do any uh, uh, pipeline work. And the usage guide is a, essentially a step-by-step -step, uh, document that will give you the exact same steps that I'm going to do in this talk. So if you really hate the sound of my voice, you can just read your way through it instead. So let's just hop over and take a look at what that looks like. So we have here the uh, Blender Studio website. And uh, let me actually go even farther back. So you would land here on the wonderful, wonderful Blender Studio website, and you would select Pipeline. And under Pipeline, you can click User Guide, and that'll bring you directly to an overview page. Over here, we have this page called TD Guide. And under the TD Guide, uh, this is um, a page that covers essentially how to deploy all the tools that we use at the studio. And I will be covering some of the topics in, in this page in more detail in a second. And you would basically follow this guide to generate the folder structure that we use at the studio, uh, which I'll cover in a moment. And then you would set up your Blender, distribute your blend, that Blender to all your users, set some add-on preferences that are very important, and then you're uh, ready to get started. Um, the usage guide covers essentially what we're going to do in this talk, which is you know, essentially what I showed in that diagram, which is taking an edit, sending that data to your Kitsu server, creating some assets, and then creating some shots with those assets, creating play blasts for those shots, all the way down to rendering those things, approving those renders, and then loading those back into your edit and then creating a final movie. So it's gonna be very information dense. I will be going a little bit quickly. There is a ton of uh, data to get through. So we're gonna start with, you saw that uh, this word in the last slide, we have this thing called uh, project tools. And project tools are a collection of scripts that we use uh, to manage and deploy productions. So when you start a production, you would go into the project tools and you will generate a folder structure. And that's the first key feature that it has. It will generate the folder structure you need for a production. And the project tools are really important because they allow us to synchronize which version of Blender uh, all the users that are, using, that are working inside this production uh, are, you, are going to use. Uh, we can synchronize the Blender version across multiple operating systems. This will work on Windows, Mac, and Linux as long as you have Python installed. 
and uh, your Blender preferences will even be stored on a per project basis. So I'm gonna just show something on the side here. Essentially, I have one right now, but if you were to uh, search in your toolbar here, Blender, I have Blender with the little name My Project. So if you imagine at the Blender Studio, we would have Blender Pets, Blender, uh, <laughs> I, just, I don't know why I blanked right there. Uh, you have Blender Pets, uh, Blender Charge, Blender Spring, et cetera, et cetera. So that way you can have custom press preferences that are specific to each production. And that might be because each production requires different add-ons or different configurations or key maps that you want to save and quickly swap between them while you're doing multiple projects at once. So that's sort of a quick overview. I'm now gonna show uh, the folder structure. So like I was saying, we have these project tools. One of the project tools is this init, pro, uh, init or initialized uh, project folder structure uh, Python script. And you would just point it at a directory where you wanna create your project and it'll create the, the top level of this folder structure I'm showing here, which are the folders. Um, you have a project folder at the top with the name of your project, and then you'd have the directories local, shared, and SVN. And this is how we break up uh, data at the Blender Studio. So the SVN directory, uh, you, the way you would set this up is essentially a TD would set it up so that the SVN directory is connected to some sort of version controlled repository. Um, obviously we use SVN at the Blender Studio and that's why it's called that. You could also use Git LFS or you could use snapshotting or any sort of um, any sort of software that allows you to have um, version control, and that's important because your blend files will go there. We have another folder called shared, and this is usually uh, for larger files, and so we would use something like Dropbox, Sync Thing, or a network file share would populate that directory. And then we have another folder called local, which is, uh, I will, basically it has Blender and your add-ons in it, but I'll explain that uh, in the next slide. So, next slide. So with project tools, you don't actually just go to your Blender binary and run it. We, instead, we run Blender through scripts and we also update them through, through scripts. So you're not going to just launch Blender from the folder that it's in. And the reason we do this is because, like I mentioned, that shared directory is shared over either a network or it's shared with Google Drive or Dropbox or Sync thing or some sort of sharing service. So when somebody updates Blender, it will download updates for every operating system into that shared directory and uh, TDs can customize what Blender branch that you're gonna be updating from. And that way, that shared directory is synchronized to uh, all the users. And then when you use the script run Blender, it'll actually copy that Blender binary into your local directory, as well as any add-ons that are global to your production. And that way, you know all your users are gonna use the same version of Blender, and they'll have whatever add-ons that you expect them to have. So let's just talk about what's actually in the folders because I've been talking a lot about what, like how you set them up. But essentially what we do is we put all of our .blend files inside the SVN directory. That would include like animation, lighting, compositing, FX, et cetera, as well as the master editing file that I was talking about in the uh, first diagram. The shared directory is, again, for things that don't need version control, so larger things like play blasts, your blender binaries that I mentioned earlier, and also the actual rendered frames that you're going to create. And I'm gonna uh, show that now actually. So I have, uh, oop. So here is uh, my project. The uh, important directories here are the shared SVN and local directories. I also have this directory called render here, which is an optional directory that I'll explain why that exists later. But essentially inside your SVN directory, you have your edit and this contains my edit. And then I have a uh, production directory. And inside here I have my shots and all that kind of jazz. And when you use project tools to generate uh, this folder structure, you also get this tools directory. And this tools directory has um, those scripts that I was mentioning, the run blender and the update blender, as well as a bunch of other scripts that are really useful. So again, I can't go into too much detail on each individual point, but the idea is that you get a collection of scripts that will manage what blender version everyone is using. And um, you put your blend files in the SVN directory and your shared uh, documents in the shared directory. So I'm just gonna cover some important preferences that if you're following along at home that you would be setting or what users would be setting. So you would, we have an important add-on called Blender Kitsu, which is what we use to interface with our Kitsu uh, project management uh, software, our server. So you would obviously just log in uh, in the add-on preferences, and then we set some uh, important directories. So that SVN directory I keep mentioning about with containing our .blend files is the root of our production as far as Kitsu is uh, concerned. And then you would tell Kitsu that we have a play blast directory or a previews directory where all your play blasts are rendered and another directory where all of your frames are rendered. And uh, we have one other add-on that's very important, which is the render review add-on. It gets very similar settings set into it. So the shots or the play blasts and the uh, frames directories are the same. And uh, we have a farm output. So this is optional. I put it at my project slash render for the simplicity of this demo, but you can put uh, your 
uh, output directory from your farm wherever you want. This is where the renders from Flamenco will show up, and we're going to see that all in the demo in a moment. And that moment is now. So we're going to start the demo. Um, I don't know how readable this is for everyone in the back, but I will just use my mouse and my words to explain. So uh, we're going to be filling in this diagram as we go through the demo. Um, but when we start, what you have is you've generated this folder structure, you've followed the TD guide to get everything set up, and the first step is to create a blend file with your previs or your storyboard or whatever data is going to inform the artists of what they're creating, and you're going to decide how long each shot is, right? Uh, from there, we're going to send that data to the Kitsu server, and that is the first thing I'm going to demo right now. So, uh, we can use the uh, run Blender script or... Uh, in the project tools, it also allows you to create uh, desktop shortcuts, which is the shortcut that I was showing earlier. So I'm going to launch Blender that way. So as you noticed here, there was a, a Blender didn't just launch on its own. It launched through this console, and this console went ahead and did uh, some updates. It made sure that all of the add-ons that we use at the Blender Studio were loaded in and are all up to date. It lets me know that Blender is updated. And this way, if uh, someone else had updated Blender and you downloaded that update from Dropbox or SyncThing, you would know that you're always on the latest version. Speaking of latest versions, yes, I know I'm a few behind, but that, this will work uh, on latest just as well. So the first thing we're going to do is go ahead and find that edit that I made. So inside my project, I have this SVN directory, and then I have uh, the uh, directory edit. And inside here, I have this uh, test production uh, blend file that I made. And what this is, like I mentioned, is just a VSC sequence with some previs in it. So if I play this, yeah, it's just some poses. Right? I, just, uh, I just created this for the demo, but the idea is that these, these are the poses that I want the animator to hit uh, during this production, and this production is super complicated because it just, well, it has one shot. I'm kidding. It's very simple. But we have this simple production here, and uh, once again, if you're following along at home, this is where you would start following along with the usage guide to actually get things set up. So we're just living in this blender. We have our, uh, our add-on preferences set, and we want to tell the Kitsu server what this shot is. So I'll select the shot. And I, we will create something called a, a meta strip. A meta strip is a representation of the shot's length and position um, between this uh, blender and the Kitsu server. And this is how we're going to synchronize data to the server. And, um, be, and I will actually go ahead and show that server right now as well. So like I was mentioning, Kitsu is a project management server. I have one big project here called My Project. In this project, I've already created some assets. Uh, to create assets, there's just a simple little button here, and you're just uh, typing in the names of the assets. Um, and uh, if you're unfamiliar, Kitsu, project management software, look at all these awesome features that it has, and basically it's just uh, for managing your production. In our case, we're going to have all of our shots. Uh, oh, okay. We're already making, a, I already made a mistake. So just give me uh, one second. I need to do something very, very simple. Um, I'm going to, yeah, no, okay, okay, you guys are all going to see this. It's fine. Okay, so let's all pause our brains and close our eyes for a moment here. I just need to uh, shut down my VM and reset it. Uh, that's fun that I already made a mistake. OK. So just give me one second. Oh, no, I shouldn't have clicked that button. I didn't want to save the state. It's fine. Restore. Don't click snapshot. Restore. And I'll start. OK. Let's head back here. And I'll just refresh this. Uh, yeah, so things happen, you know. Always, there's always something that goes wrong in a demo, and if this is the only thing that goes wrong, then I'll be very happy. <laughs> so we're just going to give it one second because it's just rebooting. But essentially, I'm just self-hosting this Kitsu uh, project here uh, on my computer, but you would set it up on some sort of uh, server that you have in your house, or you can uh, pay for uh, hosting if you're that kind of person. Studio.com. and then I know, very creative uh, email that I have here. All right, and let's... Cross our fingers and there's break. So that's open your eyes, turn your brains back on. So we're in Kitsu and we have uh, no shots as we, we just have this adorable little fox here and it tells us that we have no shots. So I'm going to go back to Blender now and the idea is that I want to populate that uh, page with some shots. So I am going to click the uh, uh, initiate or initialize uh, button and it lets me select a sequence. Um, and I just have to restart Blender because I restarted my Kitsu server. So we're just turning our brains off one more time. Great. Okay. 
So when we initialize, we were allowed to select a sequence. I created one simple sequence for this production, and we're going to give our shot a name. You can name it whatever you want, but I'm going to name it essentially shot one. And now we select our strip and we can select this uh, submit new shot button. And this button will essentially upload the timing of this shot and the name of the shot to that Kitsu server. So we can select yes, we're gonna submit the shot to the server. And then we're gonna create the default tasks for this shot and the tasks are the tasks that you would assign to different artists. So I'll just hit okay. And this will create uh, that meta strip. And now if I hop over to Kitsu and refresh, yes. So we have our shot with the name shot one. It has the timing that I had set up in that edit, and we have these tasks here for animation, lighting, and effects. So that is this first step, which is uh, setting up or uh, sending our shot data up to the Kitsu server. Uh, we're going to be building shots automatically with Blender. So we told uh, Blender or we told our shot builder what shot we want to build and when it happens, but we don't know what characters or what assets are going to exist in that shot. So that's the next step, which we're going to do on the Kitsu server. So in Kitsu, we are going to head down to uh, Breakdown, and this is where you can assign uh, assets to different shots. So we're going to select one of our many shots here, and we have uh, two characters that we're going to assign to this shot, which are the characters Rain and Snow, which are demo characters found on the studio website. And we're going to also assign uh, some props to it. So I have a bar counter and a shot class that I'm going to use during this, uh, during this shot. And uh, that's essentially the step where we assign our assets to the shot. So now we're ready to um, uh, build the shot. And just in case anyone can't see, I should have been doing this already, but over here in the bottom left is essentially our editing file. This diamond shape here is our server. And this uh, blob on the top here is representing whatever assets that we have. And um, those are all coming together to uh, make our animation shot. And inside of our animation file, we're going to be linking in and overriding all of our characters. And that's where our animator is actually going to do all the animation and actions. So to build a shot, we're going to go to, uh, I'm going to save this. We're going to go to uh, new and general. And now, uh, as long as you have the Blender Kitsu add-on set up, you're going to have some extra options here. Uh, in the new section, we have this new shot file button. So when we select this, it allows us to build a new shot. And here we're going to select uh, one of our many sequences and one of our many shots. Uh, to decide what shot we're going to build. And then we're gonna build, we're gonna decide what task type we're going to build. So in this case, we're gonna build an animation task. Later, we're gonna build a lighting task. So if I click OK, it does some little thinking, and we end up with this blend file. What it has is our characters in wonderful, wonderful typos. And in the top left of our blend file, we have uh, that previs video that I was discussing earlier. So that will also be loaded in. And we have this important, uh, we also loaded in a camera rig that we use at the Blender Studio. And we have this animation output collection, which isn't, doesn't need to be enabled. It just has all the same uh, assets that are in the scene collection linked into it. And that collection is going to be referenced by our lighting file that we're going to build later on. That's how the lighting file knows what is important to actually uh, pass down the pipeline. So if there's something that you were just using as reference or something that wasn't important, to actually render, you would leave it out of that animation output collection. All right, so I'm sure everyone's really excited to see me animate this, but uh, I'm not going to. Uh, we're gonna pretend that um, there's uh, some really, really friendly animator in the back somewhere, and he's gonna be doing some work for us. So I just have a little script that I'm running that this is just for the presentation. But essentially, we can imagine, oh, hey, our SVN or our whatever service that we're using to sync files has been updated. And now we are ready to reload this file and see our animation. So I'm just going to revert this file. And uh, Windows a little bit messy. But now we have our uh, animation. You can see all these keyframes here. And we can see our character moving and talking and uh, all the wonderful things that uh, animation productions occur in. And um, now we are done with the step of building our animation file. So this purple area on the left is the SVN directory, which is where all the blend files live. And this uh, dark green area on the right is going to represent that shared directory that we were talking about earlier, where all the larger files live. So what's going to happen is we want to create a play blast, a preview of our uh, animation. And we're going to render that to the shared directory. And then because obviously this is all about the editorial workflow, we're going to load that all the way back into our edit file so that we can preview it in the context of our uh, movies edit. So let's go ahead and do that now. So I just need to refresh this. 
So this is the kit to add on. There's lots of amazing options here, but the one that we're going to focus on is this create play blast button. And when you create it, when you ask for create play blast, you get this little dialog here. So it's going to make a lot more sense if I go and show you the Kitsu server first. So the idea is we have this shot here and we have this uh, task for animation that is set to to do currently. And a lot of people, when they use Kitsu, what they do is they write some comment here, like animation is done. You would assign uh, a new status to the task. So you can say, oh, the task is done. I'm waiting for something. I need an approval. There's, I'm going to retake this, whatever uh, the, the status you want to set is. These statuses are come with Kitsu. And maybe you would attach a file, and that file might be your, your preview video that you want to share with the rest of the team because this is super accessible and essentially where all your producers live and tell you what to do. This dialogue here is essentially the exact same thing but built directly into Blender. So we're going to select uh, done because the animation is now done. I'll leave a comment with that exact information inside of it. And uh, it, we can also set a thumbnail uh, for uh, our shot. So this is where the thumbnail would live. Right now it's empty. Oop. Right now it's empty. So you can select a frame that you want to assign as the thumbnail. Uh, by default, when you open this dialog, it'll just take whatever your current frame is. Um, this frame is a little bit silly, so I'm going to use the first frame instead. And when we select OK, we are going to now create a, a viewport render of this uh, shot. So we're just going to give this a second because it's going to process. But um, I hope everyone's following so far. But like I said, it's a lot of information. And um, you can always rewatch the talk and follow along on the uh, documents that go into a little bit more detail. And uh, you can also email me questions at nick at blender.org if you have any. So this is just going to process, so we're going to give this a minute. So the Play Blast is done um, Play Blasting, or it's done the viewport render. And now um, I can tell by the little symbol at my cursor that we're just uploading this to the Kitsu server. Things go a little bit slower in this context because I'm doing the, I've got a whole production uh, just sitting on my laptop here. All right, we got the message. Our Play Blast is created. We can head back to the Kitsu page. And now if we uh, refresh, we can see that we have our shot. We have that thumbnail that I set. And we have a comment here. The comment says that uh, the shot is done. We can see the video that we set. And we also have the text of that comment that we set here. And uh, I'm going to give myself a like. OK. It's a great job. OK. So now we're going to go back to our editing file. And we're going to load this Play Blast into our edit so that we can review it and make sure that the animator did the right job. So um, in this context, we don't have an operator that does this. You do have to do this manually the first time. But once you've Play Blasted one shot, uh, or um, yeah, once you've Play Blasted the shot once for each task for animation, lighting, compositing, et cetera, once it's done once, you can automatically update it with an arrow button that will only appear once I've actually loaded it. So I should have said that later. OK, so back to that folder structure. We have that shared directory. Inside shared, we have our editorial directory. Inside editorial, we have a directory named footage. And inside footage, we have shots, sequences, and frames. Frames is where the actual final renders will live. But shots is where we're interested in. Then we have the name of our sequence. So if you had multiple sequences, you would see them all here. Then we have the name of our shot and the name of our shots task which is animation, so it's the shot name plus animation. And finally, here is our shot. I'm going to import it without sound because we already have the sound inside this uh, editing file. And now inside of our edit, we have our animation. Things are playing. Everything is beautiful. Everything is great in the world. And if we had additional Play Blast available to us, uh, when the animator creates additional ones, you can use this up arrow right here to uh, update to those. So now we have completed this task, which is loading our Play Blast all the way into the edit. Next, we're going to build a lighting file. And our lighting file is going to be referencing our animation file. So let's go ahead and do that now. I might have to speed the pace up a little bit here because we've already covered 20 minutes. So I'll save this. And we're going to go to a new general file and a new shot file. All right, so we're going to select lighting as our task this time and select OK. Go through the same process. And now what we have is that one collection that I was mentioning earlier, animation output, is now linked into our file. And uh, if I play and I hide all this craziness, you can see, right, it's the same animation that we were just looking at earlier. So we're going to go through the same process and imagine that we've handed this off some, to some amazing, amazing artist that works with us that is going to actually do all the work. And uh, I'm going to just update the file. And now when I uh, reload this file, because the artist has posted their new update, 
we get a uh, copy, or rather, we get the same file, but now it has a bunch of wonderful, wonderful lighting in it. So if I just turn the lights on and off, we can see that there's some lighting, and amazing. So let's go back to our slideshow. I know it's a lot of whiplash going back and forth. Now we're going to go through the same process for our lighting file. We're going to create a play blast and load it all the way back into our edit. And uh, this time I'm going to cover this pretty fast because we don't want to dwell too much. But we're just going to do the exact same process, uh, which is going to play blast, saying I'm going to create a play blast. I will say that the lighting is done. Lighting is done. And I'll use this, this current frame as our thumbnail and say OK. And uh, this play blast will take slightly longer, but it'll be, it'll be great. It'll be worth it in the end. <laughs> uh, yeah. So um, essentially, this is just doing a viewport render, like the same as if you were to click the view and then uh, render animation. So it just renders whatever you're looking at in uh, your viewport. And then it'll obviously upload it uh, to the Kitsu server as well. And uh, so last time when we created our uh, Play Blast, we had this animation task set as done. And this time, we expect that our lighting task will be set as done uh, this time. And I just need to uh, ad lib for another 20 more frames, and then we're done. So uh, the render is just about done, and now we're just waiting for it to upload. But um, this is the, will be the slowest part of the talk, and then we're going to pick up the speed in just a moment. Do, 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 waiting for a load. You would think that the loading would be much faster because I have everything hosted locally on my computer, but it's not. It, uh, it is what it is. And once this uh, Play Blast is done, we're going to go check it out on Kitsu, and then once it's loaded into Kitsu, and we know that everything's working amazing, we can go back to our edit and load it in the same way, and then we're going to move on to the next step. I don't have to talk anymore. Great. <laughs> okay, so there's our lighting task. It's marked as done. There's our wonderful, wonderful lit play blast. Everything is wonderful in the world. And if I go to our um, edit file now, because like I mentioned earlier, we are going to now do this step, which is taking our shot play blast from the shared directory whoop, all the way around and into our edit. This is our edit. I'm going to make a little bit of space here. And um, because lighting is a different task, I have to go through the same process of manually loading it in. Uh, but then I will be able to uh, automatically update it in the future, which is something I will demo. I'm not just going to keep talking about it. It does exist as a feature. Um, so I'm going to select lighting. And same thing, no sound. Boop. There. Shots updated. Timing is correct. There's our wonderful, wonderful lighting. Everything is amazing in the world. So that is... That is um, this step all completed, and now let's pretend like you didn't, you've done all of those steps for like a jillion, all the shots that you have in your production, and now you're saying, okay, everything's great, I need to now do our final renders. So the next step is going to be sending this data to Flamenco. So Flamenco is our render manager, and we have an add-on that we have in Blender, and that's what this shape is here, that we use to send jobs to Flamenco, which is this diamond on the top right here. And Flamenco will render those frames, it'll create an image sequence, and it will create a preview video of the image sequence and dump them wherever we have our Flamenco storage set to, which in my case is that my project slash render directory I mentioned earlier. So we're going to go back to our lighting file. So I'll select my lighting file. I will say I should save. Probably good. Computer decides to revolt and be slow. That's fine. So. When you have the Flamenco add-on uh, enabled, Flamenco, you just need to uh, install the add-on and it'll, it'll give you this menu here. We have this little box in the bottom and there's an amazing talk by Dr. Sabrin that covers in more detail how Flamenco works. Essentially, we click this fetch jobs types button and it asks the Flamenco renderer or the Flamenco, Flamenco render manager what job types are available. By default, it'll ship with this simple blender render uh, option and this is the one that we're going to use. And we have some important settings that we have to review down here. So uh, chunk size will be the amount of frames that are rendered by each uh, task by Flamenco. In this case, we can leave this as a default. The frames are surprisingly the frames of our production, and the range is correct already. And this output directory, I keep mentioning it, we're going to set it to uh, data slash my project slash render, which is currently empty, but we're about to populate it. And adding path components will, will basically recreate the folder hierarchy of our current blend file. This way, our render uh, directory is actually nicely organized. So I'm going to set this to three. 
which will recreate uh, the three folders above this file, which is the uh, name of our shot, the name of our sequence, and then this directory called shots. So we hit submit to Flamenco, and this uh, sends everything to Flamenco, surprisingly, and uh, just wraps it all up, and uh, we got a blue thing, and everything is wonderful in the world. And now when we go over here to Flamenco Manager, we can see our task has already started. Flamenco works by rendering uh, with multiple uh, workers, they're called. So you could have multiple workstations uh, contributing to the render at once. Uh, sadly, I just have one, so things will take a little bit longer. And now we're all going to sit here for 10 minutes in silence while this finishes. I'm kidding. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. So we're going to cancel this job. We're all going to just pretend in our minds that this uh, render happened super, super fast. And I don't actually have... Um, we're going to pretend like I don't have a script that's just going to do this for us because, yes, I did do this at home earlier already. So I'm just going to uh, copy in what the final render would look like into that directory. And please behave. Thank you, sir. And now when I head over to our directories here, if we look inside render, we now get that hierarchy I mentioned. So we have shots and then the name of our sequence and then the name of our shot and then the name of the task. And Flamenco will create timestamped renders. So if you keep re-rendering the same file, you will have multiple folders with these timestamps in them, which is really convenient. So you can go through and organize. And now I have a big directory filled with a huge image sequence, one in JPEG and one in EXR, and that preview video that I mentioned. So right now, this is just living inside the Flamenco storage area. And the next step, one of our final steps, is going to be second final. There's our little counter telling you how far we are in the demo. Um, our, our next step is going to be to take whatever Flamenco just dumped out, and we're going to populate it back into that shared directory. You could imagine that you would do tons of Flamenco renders, but you don't want to distribute those to all the users. But uh, once you've decided using our render review add-on what you want to approve, uh, then you can copy, uh, the add-on will automatically copy those things into the shared directory for you. So that preview video will essentially act as a play blast. And um, the image sequences will be copied into the directory frames. So let's hop back over to uh, Blender. So because we have render review enabled, we have this extra option in the new section. So we're going to select new render review. And render review works on a sequence level. And so I'll select uh, one of our many sequences that we have here. And uh, if you're working over a network, you might want to use videos uh, to preview things. But thankfully, I'm working uh, locally off this laptop, so I can just open it like this. So if you had rendered multiple Flamenco renders, you would have multiple of these uh, yellow uh, image sequence strips. And if we look here, we can now see that we have our final render. And uh, I won't say that everything's right in the world again, but I've said that too many times. Uh, we have this button here that says Inspect EXR. And this just lets us open an image uh, viewer. And we can just go into detail and look at how pixelated and low, low res that I rendered this to make things fast. But you know, it is what it is. And we have this important button here, which is called Push to Edit and Approve Render. And this is the button that will copy those things and do the step that I just described. I don't have to repeat myself a million times. So we're going to select this. And it will copy that. Actually, OK, I am pre repeating myself. We're just going to copy that uh, preview video into the Playblast directory. It's going to copy our frames into a frames directory that we expect uh, that we can load into our edit later. So I'll just select OK. And this does all of the copying. I selected it. Yeah, OK, good. And now, if I close our render directory and I go inside shared editorial and, sorry, shared, yeah, editorial footage. There we go. Uh, our shots directory now has two uh, videos inside of our lighting uh, folder, our lighting task. And inside the frames directory, we now have a similar folder structure, and that contains our lighting task with our render from Flamenco. Okay, so that's all great. We've done that render, but it's just living in that shared directory. So now the final step that I'm going to, do, uh, the final step I'm going to go into detail on is to take all that data, whoop, load it all the way back into our edit. So let's go to Blender. We're going to return to our test production. I don't need to save this review. And I'm going to move the meta strip up one more time to make a little bit of space. And now I can finally demo this button. So if you select the lighting uh, file and you click this up arrow, it will move up to the next play blast that's available in that directory. In our case, it's the preview of our final render. And if I play it, everything is looking great. So 
if you're actually creating your final render, you obviously don't want to make it off of this preview video. So we want to load that image sequence that we approved with the render review add-on. So I have this button that says shot as image sequence. So I select this and we can choose which channel and which file type we want to use uh, for our image sequence. This will work if you select multiple strips. In most cases, I would imagine you would have multiple shots. You select them all at once. And when I select OK, yay, it worked. Had a bug there earlier. Um, now we have that image sequence loaded into our edit file. So we're, now we've gone from uh, that preview, that previs video that we had in the beginning. If I hide these, yeah. So we had our, our previs video. Then we had our animation play blast. Then we had a preview, or let's actually go down. Then we had our lighting file and our lighting play blasts. And finally, we have our final render that we did with the Flamenco uh, manager that hopefully went very fast. And this is now our final assembled edit where we have all the nonsense loaded into our VSC. So you got two options here now. Most people might want to just render normally with Blender. You can just use normal export and you can customize your settings here and make sure it's high quality and get it out. Or there's another step that I'm not going to demo, but I am going to explain, which is, please behave computer, thank you. Uh, on our project usage page, we have this um, really, really uh, long uh, guide here called Final Render. But what this essentially, uh, what we're doing at the Blender Studio is we render the film out of the VSC as a PNG sequence. And then we render the audio as a separate file, and those both go into a directory named Deliver. The reason we do that is because if you want to update little bits of the, pro of the film as uh, you're getting near the end, as often happens, you just need to update those frames instead of the entire file. And then we have a script that's delivered uh, inside the Blender Studio Pipeline uh, repository that will mux those two together and give you your actual final uh, file. So if you're uh, really, really into Blender Studio and you want to do everything exactly the same, you could follow these steps as well. So that is the entire uh, editorial workflow that we use at the Blender Studio. And now we have some time to do little questions if you guys would like. But that's it. Yes. Uh, when the project uh, becomes kind of big with all these layers and everything, does this bottleneck at one point just slow down or everything goes very smoothly no matter what how big the project is? For, for the size of the projects that we use at the Blender Studio, well, we haven't had a problem yet, but uh, we're always innovating and updating things. So if we ever changed things, uh, you would get those updates because I'll be updating the documentation that I directed you guys to. But essentially, uh, we've, we, things have gone pretty smoothly. The biggest challenge is uh, syncing all of the uh, play blasts, but uh, we self-host sync thing at the Blender Studio and it's, uh, it's pretty efficient. Um, the biggest complication you might have would be uh, if you want to set folder permissions for different people. That's not something that we do, but it is possible to do, uh, but that might make things a little bit more complicated. Yes. Oh, let me just hop back. Yeah, I, I understand the question completely. So, oh, so the question is, um, I loaded a JPEG uh, sequence as the image sequence that we uh, did here. And you might want to use something uh, more detailed if you're going to do color grading. If I select this guy again, I actually had both um, available to me. So I can select an EXR sequence. And in the, in the file that you send to Flamenco, you can set your EXR settings for what compression level that you want. And I can do the exact same thing with this, and I will load the EXR version of the image sequence. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, but how, how do you do that and keep it in your We can't really play the EXRs in real time, which is why we have the option for, to do JPEGs as well. But um, most of our color grading happens at the compositing uh, stage, which we do on a shot basis. Right, Andy? You also do it in the edit. You also do it in the edit? So how would, how would we, but we wouldn't get it in real time. Yeah. So, yeah, so as far as real time color grading goes, we, we don't. Yeah, if, uh, because when you, um, 
uh, here, if I, the, the simplest way to do that, and I think this is what Andy has done in the past, because I have this operator, you can just import both versions into the edit and stack them on top of each other, and then hide and swap, because at this point, your edit isn't changing, so there's no stress there. Um, but yeah, that's how that works. Thank you for the question. Um, if we don't have any other, oh yeah. Yes. Is there a way of reusing the posing and the camera when you create the animation file, or do you start with everyone in two pose and that's it? So the, 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 it's just a bit of a, uh, it's actually, so the question it's is, in an automated way. yeah, yeah. So the question is, my, my previous video already had some characters posed, and could you uh, reuse those poses? The answer to that question is that I faked that uh, previous, and it was actually just this image sequence that I, uh, uh, put into MATCAP and I rendered it. So in most cases, we would just have a storyboard or something like that, and that's and that's why uh, starting from a T pose is totally fine. But if you did do previs, you would just be able to, uh, and you use the same or similar rigs. You could uh, load the anim the uh, actions for those rigs from the previs files and into uh, your production file. Uh, that would be the way that we'd probably handle that if it was an option. What did you say? Yeah, but you'd have to do that manually. It's not part of the pipeline. But it's an interesting feature if we integrate more previs in the future. Yes? Uh, okay, so the question is, do you see different versions of the, uh, how do we handle versioning essentially? So when we, um, every time we update the file, we save a, an SVN checkout. So if you wanted to go back in time, we would revert with the SVN. As far as alternative versions, we don't normally do alternative versions, do we? But um, in Kitsu, what you will have is a history of all the comments and play blasts that were uploaded. So you would, uh, did I repeat the question actually? No, I, oh, yeah, I did. So um, in Kitsu, you'll see all the different versions of the Play Blast in time. And um, yeah, I, uh, I'm trying to think here. It, normally, if we, if, have we ever created an alternative shot? Like an alternate for the same shot? In layout, yeah. Yeah, so if, if it was going to be a totally alternative version that needed to exist while the, the original also existed, we would make it a separate file. And otherwise, we just uh, version up with SVN. And if someone has gone too far, we revert the SVN uh, to back in time to get the older versions. And we would decide which version to use by reviewing the comments in Kitsu and looking at the play blasts. Does that answer? Yeah. Sorry. That's how, that's how we work, yeah. But you could, in theory, check out only parts of it if that, the artist needed that. But at the scale of the production that we do, we just check out the entire thing. Any other questions? Yes. Okay, actually, I, can, I think I can demo this quickly. So the, the question is, if you, how do we handle new shots or inserting shots? And I assume you also are wondering, basically, if the shot timing changes, what happens? Yeah, I mean, for the shots, like I said, what, the, what does it do? The new shot, the so we have a naming scheme where we, we um, if basically every, like, if you see how I named the, the shot, it's not shot one, it's shot 10 in a way. So uh, as far as adding the new shot, you would we would use that extra zero at the end to uh, insert that name. But it, um, it also brings up the question of what happens when the timing slightly changes during production. So um, if I just go sort of back in time here and remove some things. So let's say I had just this animation and I had this meta strip and I wanted to either shift it in time, or I'll, for my sake, I'm just going to move it backwards a little bit. Uh, this is where the meta strip uh, comes in handy. So let's say I've moved my animation uh, file, and I've decided that this is how long it should be instead of the length it was previously. I can select the meta strip, 
and we have a button to uh, push me new metadata for this strip back up to the server. So I will select that button, and when we go to Kitsu, so our shot right now is out at 157, and the length is 156 frames. Now when I refresh it, because I pushed an update, the length is now 136 frames, and it goes out at 137. And now, if I were to go to my animation file, it's funny, this is something I cut out of the talk. Um, so now, if we go back to our animation file, um, where is the button? Oh, we have a button here that says pull frame range. Um, let me just revert this, reload it one more time. It should get mad at me, there we go. So I get this big red button here that says, ah, no, stop, it's the wrong timing. And you have to select this pull frame range button before you can continue working. That will update the frame range. So now it's 136 frames long. If I check the, uh, oop, behave, please. Okay, you're just gonna become a timeline then. That's your punishment. So now, <laughs> uh, so now it's 136 frames long because we start on 101. And, that, and starting on 101 gives us some headroom if I were to time it the other way. I also can do the same thing. But that's essentially how that handles. And now when I create a play blast and I load it on top of my meta strip, it will uh, match the timing there. So um, that's how the updates are handled. And I'll go here. And yeah. Yes. Oh, Andy, we use caches, don't we? Yeah, that's fair. So yeah, so it's possible to cache the animation. We just um, aren't using it at the moment. Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah, so the question is how do we, if we were on the FX step and we needed to uh, expose like a character or something to inform uh, whatever FX we're doing, I, correct me if I'm wrong, Andy, but I believe we would still, we would just override that animation output collection to expose all the objects within it so that you can read the information there. Um, yeah, I'm very smart. <laughs> yes, sir. So this is completely off topic, but I'm going to seize the opportunity. Okay. We're getting a lot of questions. Yeah. So the question is, how do we deal with uh, noise sampling? And yeah. these are these are more questions that that I'm really happy you're here, Andy, because they kind of live in your world as well. Um, I think we just push the samples as far as we can, don't we? Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah. Yeah. It's it's complicated, but um, the short answer is we push them as far as we can go. Um, that's just about noise sampling. Yeah. So um, uh, we have time for any more questions, but otherwise I'm really happy that you guys all came and thank you for coming and I hope it mostly made sense. <laughs>